Look at all of you. Thank you for coming. It means the world to God that you're here in this place. It truly does. I just want to thank you for being here. And it's valuable. It's valuable. Again, worshiping in this place is a valuable thing. It's not where, but how. This is important. It's very important. So thank you for coming today. As you kind of settle in here, let me just say, it's nearly impossible to preach on the, the Apostle Paul in one week. You just can't do it. I could spend the rest of my days until my death preaching on the Apostle Paul, and I would never get through. I'm not going to tell you really any stories from his life except for maybe one. I'm going to give you some scriptures. Monday morning when we were here in prayer, I was praying something, and Miss Sarah started praying, and I thought, oh, there it is. I'm going to give you a few scriptures this morning that he shared. But I'm telling you, of the 66 books in the Bible, most of them cover the Apostle Paul. Um, his life, his writings, his ministry, his work. As you're settling in, let me say this to you too. People killing for what they believe to be right is who we are as a people. Shouldn't be, but it is who we are as a people. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. It's easy to look at Paul and say he's a bad guy. We like to say bad guys, good guys. We like to say the bad guys are over there and I don't want to be one of the bad guys. I want to be one of the good guys. You know what I mean? I don't want to be one of the bad girls. I want to be one of the good girls. You know what I mean? But this is part of who we are. And people all over the world believe so strongly in what they believe that they are willing to kill other people to protect what they believe. So we shouldn't be surprised that the Man Saul, so sound in his religious beliefs, believed that what Jesus and his followers were doing was absolutely wrong, and they were willing to kill in order to protect what they believed to be right and true and pure. I'm not justifying what he did. I'm just saying don't be surprised by that because we do it all the time as humans. We kill in order to protect what we believe to be right and true, okay? So that's part of this story of Paul. Do you know what else is part of the story? He was genuinely pursuing God. Now, sometimes we miss that because we like to put him over there as a bad guy. But Paul was really trying in his life prior to the Damascus Road he was searching for God. That's important. From that context, I want to begin this sermon with a poem. It's called Overland to the Islands. I read it in a book that Eugene Peterson wrote, and I was taught this poem by Jason Upton. When I was in Milwaukee a couple of weeks ago, we had a long discussion about this poem. It's about how a dog roams. And I really believe with all of my heart, it's how those of us that are pursuing God, pursue God. And I believe in... I hate to stick a word on it. In religion, spirituality, Christianity's purest form, it's how God is supposed to be found. Let's go. As much as that dog goes, intently haphazard. Just pause there. Intently haphazard. I had to put down two dogs in six weeks, my family and I, two basset hounds. If you've ever known or had a hound, is this not how they roam? Intently, haphazard, 
My vet, when we bought those two basset hounds, told us, don't be surprised, that dog is going to follow its nose. Intently haphazard. The Mexican light on a day that smells like autumn in Connecticut makes iris ripples on his black gleaming fur. And that too is as one would desire, a radiance consorting with the dance. Under his feet, rocks and mud, his imagination, sniffing, engaged in its perceptions, dancing edgeway. There's nothing the dog disdains on his way. Does this sound like your pursuit of God? It's kind of all over the place, isn't it? Leads you there and you smell something good. Leads you there and smell something stinky. Leads you there, leads you there, leads you there. There's nothing the dog disdains on his way. Nevertheless, he keeps moving, changing pace and approach. Watch this, but not direction. That's powerful, man. Changing the pace, changing the approach, but never the direction. Every step and arrival. And that's powerful. Jesus offered this poem first in the Gospel of Matthew. Don't think that I've come to abolish the law and the prophets. See, that's what Paul was after. Paul was after the law and the prophets with that hound dog nose life of his. Sniffing, 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 sniffing. And every day was an arrival in Paul's life. Every day. Jesus says, I didn't come to abolish the law and the prophets. I didn't come to abolish them. I came to fulfill them. I came to bring genuineness and truth to all your sniffing around. For truly I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. Therefore, any one of you who sets aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. That's Stop there. What's he saying? Don't throw the law out. Don't throw a pharisaical pursuit of God out. It's part of the journey. Don't throw all of your experience out in this room in attempting to find God. Every day you have lived up to this point has brought you to this point. Every day of your spiritual journey has been an arrival. And Christ has met you in every single point along the way. And now here you stand. Right here in this place, in this moment. With Christ looking at you saying, I want to draw you to a deeper depth. Whew, goodness. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now watch this. For I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. See, this isn't about morality. It's not about church attendance. It's not about some sort of religiosity. It is about the revelation of the resurrected Christ in our midst in this moment and your awareness of and obedience and submission to the resurrected Lord in this place. And your nose has brought you here today. And recognize that what you're sniffing today is the very aroma of Jesus Christ. That's important. Mm -hmm. To be present and prepared, we must remember Paul's journey teaches us that whether we pursue, rebel, or wander through life. Christ is always revealed, and with the revelation comes the arrival of new birth, a new name, Saul to Paul, and a new life in Christ alone that each is called to choose. There are some of us in this room today who have been called 
to new life in Jesus Christ. There are people in this room who have not given their lives to Jesus Christ. Your nose has brought you to the call to be born again here this morning. There are some in this room whose nose has brought you to not going back to that old name anymore. Jacob followed God for decades before he wrestled with God and said, I know I can't beat you, but I will not let you go. And God said, there we go. That's what I was looking for all along. You're walking out of here, brother, with a new name. You are no longer to be called Jacob. You are to be called Israel. And if you don't think God will change your name after being with you for a little while, you don't know the Bible. Abram to Abraham, Jacob to Israel, Simon to Peter, Saul to Paul. God will change your name. You may have accepted Christ, but today your nose has brought you to a place where God says, I don't want you going back to that old name anymore. Today I'm giving you a new name. And for some of us in this room who have followed Christ for a very, very long time, We are getting to the point where our nose has brought us to a place that says, I don't want to live for anything in this world anymore. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's powerful. Let's talk about Paul here today. I love this book by N.T. Wright. He says, in Paul's day, Religion consisted of God-related activities that, along with politics and community life, held a culture together and bound the members of that culture to its divinities and to one another. Now pick up what he's saying here. This is important. In the modern Western world, religion tends to mean God-related individual beliefs and practices that are supposedly separable from culture, politics, and community life. This is a problem that we have. We have a God pursuit, but it's only in a portion of our life. We have compartmentalized our relationship to Jesus Christ, and that's the portion of our life that we call Christian. But our relationship with Jesus has got to be driving the train. Listen to me, and I know this sounds crazy. The Bible is not the foundation of your faith. Christianity is not the foundation of your faith. Do you know what the foundation of your faith is? The resurrected Lord, Jesus of Nazareth. Now those things are products of Jesus of Nazareth, but the foundation of your faith is not something, it's someone. It is the resurrected Lord. And the resurrected Lord has got to drive the train of your entire life. For Paul, religion was woven in with all of life. For the modern Western world, it's separated from it. See, this is why I'm saying this thing's got to drive the ship. So when Paul talks about advancing in Judaism beyond any of his age, the word Judaism refers not to religion, but to an activity. It was the absolute outflow of who he was as a person. The zealous promotion and defense of the ancestral way of life. See, this is why he believed in what he believed in terms of God so strongly that he was willing to die and kill for it. I don't think that's right, killing for it. But that was the fuel in his life. Like an old hound dog with his nose to the ground, he was in pursuit of God. And where did his active pursuit of God lead him? To the Damascus Road. Where all of a sudden, with the church's full backing, understand that, with the church's full backing to kill Christians, as he's on the way to Damascus, Jesus Christ shows up. Now this is important. This is very important. Because this isn't just, you heard what Daniel said, this isn't just an experience. This is a revelation of the resurrected Christ. Look, I can't put God on my hand and prove him empirically to you. But I can tell you about the times that I came face to face with Almighty God. 
And this is what makes the change in Paul's life so very real. He didn't just hear about God. He wasn't just doing godly type of stuff. He came face to face with God. And that's why this is so important. This is why I'm a stickler about how we worship. We've got to come in contact with the resurrected God. On this journey that Saul, soon to be Paul, is on, on the road to Damascus, all of a sudden, go ahead guys, all of a sudden, Jesus shows up and knocks him straight to the ground. And a voice said to Saul, 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 why do you persecute me? Man, that is powerful, guys. Jesus takes this stuff personally. He takes it personally. You being here or not here, he takes it personally. You, listen, man, God loves you. And when we don't love God back, he takes that personally. When we are traveling our nose in a wrong direction, when we catch a scent of the world and go in a way that God would not have us to go, God takes that personally. God doesn't say, Saul, Saul, why are you killing Christians? He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul, who was genuinely attempting to pursue God, has the wherewithal in his sniffing spiritual nose to say, who are you? Lord, I know you rank above me. I know you have knocked me down. I know I am blinded on this road to Damascus and I've got no way of hope and you are the only one in charge. And Jesus says, well, let me tell you who I am. You've been looking for me, and I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. That is powerful. When I was 16 years old, 15 years old, Jesus Christ appeared in my bedroom. I never saw him. I was too scared to turn around. But you can't take that away from me. I know he was there. And when I was 18 years old, after a Good Friday service, I drove down to Westover Park in the rain, and I stood on that hillside under an umbrella looking out over Westover Park, and Jesus Christ was with me. You can't take that away from me. <laughs> and I was right here in November of 2010, after 40 days of not eating a single solid piece of food, with my eyes closed, and I did one of these. You got this eye, it's open. And God, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who was present with me, said, Kevin, I have been with you for the last 40 days sustaining you. You got to ask me, am I here? Son, I've been with you all along. You can't take that away from me. And I can tell you time and time and time and time again where Jesus Christ has revealed himself to me in my life. James Saban, true or false, standing in that booth right there in 2013, did we or did we not see the glory cloud of God hovering over this sanctuary? We did, and no one can take that from us. Can I empirically prove that? I cannot, but that is the revelation of Jesus Christ in all of our lives. And I'm telling you folks, the book of Romans says, I don't care whether you're actively pursuing God, passively pursuing God, or rebelling from God. You're gonna come face to face with the revelation of Jesus Christ at some point of your life, and none of us can claim ignorance. When Jesus Christ stands before you, you've got to do something with that. You've got to do something with that. If Paul could tell you anything, that's what he'd say. 
when Jesus knocks you to the ground in his blinding revelatory life, respond to him by saying, you are the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That's not conversion. It's discovery and submission of the one and to the one who's standing in front of you right now. This was not a conversion in the sense of leaving behind the Jewish world and starting or promoting a new religion. But it was a conversion in the sense that Israel's Messiah himself was going down into death, had taken with him the whole world, including the whole Jewish world and its traditions, in order, to, in order then to emerge from death in a new form, and in the sense that all those who now belong to the Messiah shared that death, the res that resurrection, and the new identity that followed. There'd never been a moment when Paul had not been out and out loyal to the one God. But the one God had unveiled his age-old purpose in the shocking form of the crucified Messiah, and that changed everything, a contested loyalty. Now that brings us to you all here in this room, because you are here today, and I'm preaching to the choir. <laughs> and there's a decision that has to be made. Because if you just keep, and I'm not saying you, but collectively all of us, if we simply give ourselves to a theology or an institution or a book and we ignore the resurrected Christ who is in front of us, we're not going to get very far. But if you'll give your life to the resurrected Lord who stands in front of you right now, he will absolutely flip your life upside down. And see, that's the hindrance. You're not quite sure if you'll want your life flipped upside down. Frankly, I like how my life is going. Don't mess with it. Or it can't get any worse. Fine, I'll take it. Rarely do people come to Christ by inspiration. I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just telling you the reality. I've done this a long time. Most people are not inspired to follow Jesus. They're challenged. They're concerned. They hit a brick wall. But I'm telling you right here, right now, Christ stands in front of you. Be inspired to follow him with every part of who you are. And then say the words that Paul said to churches all over this world. Let me give you two of the things that he said. For through the law, I died to the law so that I might live for God. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All of that time that Saul was attempting to live a godly life and trying to keep all the rules, all that, the God, all that God did with that law was put it there. Not so we could mimic it and be perfect, but so that we would see in some way in 10 commandments plus a million the holiness of God and realize I can never keep all of that. And so all of that stuff that says do this, do this, do this, do this. Don't do, don't do, don't do, don't do. Say, 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 say. Don't you dare say, don't you dare say, don't you. You'll never live up to that. And all of that says because you'll never live up to that, how are you going to get out of all of this? Jesus Christ. That's what he's saying. Through the law, I died to the law. I realized that the law couldn't save me. I allowed it to drive me to Christ. And just as the crucified Lord was crucified for me, I'm now crucified with him. And all of that old life that I used to live, it's crucified. Crucifixion is a long process. Some of you die immediately. And some of you, and I don't mean some of you and some of you, I mean like some of you dies immediately. And some of you takes a little longer to die. Get it? You're not perfect. 
You're being made perfect as the Father in heaven is perfect. You're dying slowly. And as I am crucified with Christ, I'm living. I am living. And the life that I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God. Not faith in anything else. I'm living by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Is that the battle cry of your life? Or are you living for something else? Is there a different fuel that's fueling you? Or is the resurrected life of Jesus of Nazareth the absolute and total soul fuel for your life? That's what I'm asking you to give your life to. Paul also says this to the church at Philippi. For it is we who are Jewish, we who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who have put no confidence in the flesh. Think about that. How much confidence do you put in the flesh? Though I myself have reason for such confidence. I'll translate in a second. If someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness based on the law, faultless. If anyone could have lived a moral and religious life, Paul is saying, I was your guy, but it led me to not perfection, but the one who is perfect, and that is Jesus Christ. Whatever were gains to me, and this is what I'm saying to you, what are your gains today? What are your gains apart from Jesus of Nazareth? Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. Will you give up everything for Christ? What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. This is why I say, I don't care if you go to a Mountaineer game. I don't care. Go to a Mountaineer game. But is that loss compared to knowing Jesus Christ? I'm not talking about learning more about Christianity. I'm talking about knowing Jesus. I'm talking about him showing up in your bedroom. I'm talking about him showing up in this sanctuary. I'm talking about him shining the glory cloud down in your life. And I'm not looking for ecstatic experience. I want you to recognize when Jesus is standing beside you and you don't have to beg him to show up. I don't want you to ever have to hear God say, I don't know who you're talking to, but you ain't talking to me. Whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. Look at that. I consider them garbage. I consider that. What are you throwing away? Tomorrow's my trash day. What am I throwing away tomorrow? What are you throwing away today? I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own. Paul said, been there, done that, it didn't work. That comes from the law. But that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. When you follow Christ, it is scary. It is absolutely scary. Because he's going to ask you to do some stuff that are going to royally mess up your life, your plans, your ways, the way that you think it's going to be stable. God asked you to do the most unstable of things, and you realize the most unstable of things are the greatest stability you could have ever had in the first place. That's powerful, man. He's about to flip your whole world upside down if you'll just let him. Man. I want to know Christ. Yes. To know the power of his resurrection. Ashley, you just sung this. You just sung it. Participation in his sufferings. Pause for a second. Why are we so hell-bent, and I say that intentionally, why are we so hell-bent on the rapture being the right way? Pre-trib, mid-trib, post-trib, don't get into that conversation with me. I'm not your guy. We have people longing for the resurrection to occur because I sure don't want to go through the tribulation. Well, you better take your exacto knife out and cut that part of the book of Philippians out because that's what it says. 
Don't you want to participate in the sufferings of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? If he wore a crown of thorns, why, as Martin Luther says, would you put on a crown of roses? I'm just saying. I want to participate. Like, who prays that prayer? Trust me, that is not on that board over there. I'll bet you if I looked at every single one of those right there, not a one of them says, Lord, help me to participate in your suffering. There's a lot that's, and I'm not discounting any of these prayers. There's a lot of them that are saying, Lord, I'm suffering, get me out of it. But I'll bet you there's not a single prayer on that board that says, let me participate in your suffering. We got to flip this thing upside down. And the way it's flipped upside down is by surrendering to the one who can flip it. Becoming like him in his death. And so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Do you hear that? Do you hear that? The only way that we are really going to attain to the resurrection from the dead is to say for me to live as Christ and to die as gain. That's why I get choked up in my throat because I'm not there yet. I want to so badly be able to say that in my life. I can't say it because I still like this world too much. I still like the world too much. Every person will encounter the revelation of Jesus and then is called to choose evolution. And I know that word scares some people. Evolution into life with and pursuit of Christ alone. Will you allow God to evolve your life, evolve your life into life with and pursuit of. That's what A.W. Tozer said. He said, it's when you find God that the real search begins. <laughs> There's a passage in C.S. Lewis's Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe where Mr. Beaver says to the four little kids, farther in, Farther in. All of our lives should be a calling. Farther in. Farther in. Farther in. You know, these prayers that you pray, Daniel, and I'm not picking on you here. Don't take it that way. These prayers that you pray are as powerful of prayers as I've ever had prayed over me or stood beside hearing pray. Okay? There's a farther in component, though, that God is calling him to. Because that, and this is what I've experienced in my own life, where I think God is, and God is, he says to me, farther in. And that's the pursuit of side. You see what I'm saying? That's the pursuit of side. That's hard, man. That's hard. And that includes participation in Christ's sufferings, death, and resurrection. Last thing. Paul had come to the point where he was content to share the Messiah's death in order that he might arrive with him at the ultimate hope of Israel, the resurrection of the dead. Now, that's not figurative. That's literal. He knew he was going to die for the gospel of Christ. Read your Bible. Only one got out alive. And he died too and had a heck of a life on the way while he was dying. And that's John. John's the only one that died a natural death, most likely. But it wasn't a dandy life. Only one got out of life. Western Christianity don't understand struggle. Come on now. Nobody amens that one. Let it be so. Let's go another direction. But Paul says, I want to know death so soundly that I can experience the resurrection from the dead. The ancient story of Israel had been fulfilled in the Messiah. How'd this whole thing begin? A guy named Saul saying, I know the ancient story of Israel and Jesus is wrong. Then he gets knocked down into the ground on the Damascus Road, and he goes, oh, Jesus is Lord. And he learns the ancient story of Israel through the resurrection from the dead 
of Jesus of Nazareth. All Paul's previous zeal for God and the law had to be counted as trash by contrast. For I'm already being poured out like a drink offering, and the time for my departure is near. I fought the good fight. I finished the race. I've kept the faith. Now there is in store for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have longed for his appearing. See, and I'm asking you that, too. Do you long for the appearing of Jesus Christ? When you look to the east, are you expecting to see Jesus? When you walk in this room, are you expecting to meet him here? When you wake up in the night, when your brain goes on before your eyes go open, is the first thought in your head, good morning, Lord. Do you long for his appearing? I'm not saying do you go to church. I'm asking you, do you long for his appearing? Do you want to die so dead that you know the resurrection from it? Hmm. Maturity in Christ daily arrives at and responds alongside the revelation of Christ by meeting the Lord in the resurrection from the dead and living life from a resurrection from the dead context alone. I'm not there, but boy, do I want to be there. I'm trying, guys, and I want you to try to I want us all to try together. That's why I harp on coming to morning prayer. That's why I harp on reading your scriptures. That's why I harp on coming to church. That's why I harp on fasting. That's why I harp on allowing everything that you do in your life and I do in my life to be about the advancement of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Everything. It's why I harp on it all the time. And I'm not leaving. And I want us all to be together in this struggle in this fight every single day. So where are you in the process? Because we're all somewhere. Right now, where's the revelation of Jesus? Well, for us, it's right here, right now. Do you understand that this could be one of those moments for you where you come face to face with Christ? Just let it happen. Don't try to control it. Don't try to conjure it, because that's witchcraft. Just let Jesus reveal himself to you in this moment. Do you need to give your life to Christ today? Have you arrived at new birth? Have you arrived at a name change today? Are you done playing with that old name? You want your new name today? Have you arrived at the life crucified with Christ? That, If you're asking me today, that's where I am. I can't say yes to this last one because I'm just not there yet. Have you arrived at life solely to be lived from the context of Jesus' resurrection from the dead? I want that last one so badly, but I'm not there. God still has a lot more wood, hay, and stubble to burn out of my life. That's hard for a pastor to say that to his congregation. But man, guys, I want that more than anything in the world, to only know death and the resurrection from the dead. That's all I want to know in my life. It's all any of us should know. But let's just start with welcoming Jesus. Like Saul, before you acknowledge that your life's journey has brought you to this revelatory arrival, like Paul before you, find fulfillment in Christ alone. Well, God, as Daniel moves to his corner and I move to mine, what are you saying to us today, God? I think we've heard you. And every person gets to hear farther in, farther in. I could say a lot more, but how about this, God? Just have your way. Jesus, would you meet one and all in this room today? Would you look each of us and all of us in the eye in this moment? say I'm right here I'm not going anywhere I never have and I never will I'd like to bring revelation of myself to you right now 
Will you receive it? Will you surrender to it? When I say it, I mean me. Holy Spirit, you, as Daniel prayed a little bit ago, have authority in this place. Have your way right now. For weeks now, I have been asking to infiltrate Morgantown, flood it with your angelic host, and to fill it with your presence to win it through us back to you. Start in this room right now, God. Start in this room right now. Turn our hearts back to you. Help us to say we're sorry, God. We were wrong. We love you. Please forgive us. And say to us, I do forgive you. I have forgiven you. And I do and will always love you. Come home. Come home. Thank you, God. Thank you so much. We love and give you praise. It's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen.